Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Nathan Hoag. I have the privilege of being the parish pastor here at the Sacred Grace Inglewood. It's really great to be with you tonight. And I want to begin tonight by saying a big thank you to all of you. Uh, certainly, this church is run by a lot of people. Hopefully, you've figured that out by now. Um, I'm by no means the sole person who is putting this thing together. Um, in fact, there are typically somewhere between 10 and 20 people who run this place on any given Sunday night. I often show up on Sunday nights and don't have a job because all of you are doing it. Uh, last Sunday, I was out of town, and I heard that things went off without a hitch, which was not surprising to me at all. So a big thanks to our staff, but also our volunteers who have particular roles and tasks. And thank you also to all of you. Because somewhere along the way, we have created a culture um, and cultivated a culture of ownership. And many of you treat this church as if you have like stock in the company. And I really appreciate that. Uh, there's, a, there's a high level of participation. And you think that this, is church, this church is yours because it is. And you treat it that way. And that means a lot to me and to my family. It gives us a chance to get away and get a break. And that goes a really long way for us. So thank you for all of that. It feeds nicely into what we're talking about tonight. Um, there's a particular word that I want to focus on tonight, um, and it kind of fits into the other words that we're focusing on throughout this series. As you know, if you've been here before, and if not, I'll catch you up, we're in the middle of a series that we do every October about our vision and our values, particularly. Um, Bree mentioned the ways that we move towards God, towards each other, towards ourselves, out towards our community. We move up, we move in, and we move out, and we do all of this attached to and shrouded in the grace of God. And we take time every year to remind ourselves what that means, to remember what it means to give ourselves to these things. But tonight, I want to take a minute um, to focus on a word that isn't included in those things, but a word that we tack on and shove into almost every sentence we say around here. It's a word that will be very familiar to you, even though we don't talk about it very often. It's a word that all of a sudden, after I say it in just a minute, you will see all over the place. That word is the word together. We use the word together at the beginning of sentences and in sentences and in statements and mantras here at the Sacred Grace on a regular basis. We regularly say things like, together, we are following the way of Jesus. We are doing this as a unit, as a body, as a community. Together, we are moving up, in, and out. Together, we are joining God in what he's already doing in the lives that we are already living. As Jared mentioned last week, he mentioned a quote by Abraham Kuyper, um, all of this is God's. Uh, we have this um, idea, I think it's a particularly American idea, that if we show up and initiate something, then God will start doing something, when in reality it all belongs to him and he's already doing stuff. It's a matter of us joining him in it. Um, together, we choose to be generous because our Father is generous. We'll tack that word onto and into just about anything and everything we can around here because we believe genuinely and honestly that that is how we were designed, that is how we were created to move and to work and to act. Our text tonight comes from the book of Genesis. It's actually a text that Jared mentioned last week. I'm going to talk about a different aspect of it tonight. And we're going to be in Genesis chapter 1, um, verses 24 through 29, and also verse 31 as well. You can follow along on the screen, or you can open it up on a Bible app if you'd like. It goes like this. And God said, let the, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kind, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God made humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and every other living creature that moves along the ground. God saw what he had made and said it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning on the sixth day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, prior to this passage, there are several lists of things that God creates. The expanse of the sky, the sea, the dirt, the grass, the animals, everything. God creates it all. And after each section, when he creates something, he says, that's good. I created that, and it's good. I created that, and it's good. And then he creates human beings, humankind, and he says, that's very good. He adds a word there. He's saying, good, good, tov, tov is the Hebrew word. And then he says, tov meod, very good. This, these humans are very good. Something Reuben reminded us of a couple weeks ago, that we are, in fact, the capstone of God's creation. We are his favorite thing. If God has a museum, we are the Mona Lisa somewhere in that museum that he takes everybody to last and says, this is it, human beings, 
this is the thing that I've created that I'm most proud of and excited about. Very good, Tov Mayod. But right after this, God calls the first thing in creation not good. And you might think if you've been around church or the Bible long enough that you know exactly what I'm talking about. The thing that God calls not good is either the sin or the snake, right? It's either the sin or the snake. It's either because snakes are not good and sin is not good. So that must be the next thing that happens in the story that God calls not good. But it's not. There's something prior to the sin and the snake that God calls not good. And it's extremely important for our conversation tonight and for this series that we're in and for our church as a whole. Right after this dialogue um, between God and his creation as he's creating and making, he says, it is not good for human beings to be alone. Lo tov, not good. He says, these things are tov. These things, especially human beings, are tov mayod. But for this human being to be alone is lo tov. This is not good. This is not how I designed human beings to be. And so quickly after that, God creates another human being. And so we have Adam and Eve as the story goes, right? And they're in the garden and they're together. And it's likely that the last time you heard a pastor talk about this passage, it was either in a sermon about marriage or it was at a wedding ceremony itself, right? Because that's the only time we ever talk about this passage. The problem with that is I actually don't think that that's what this particular part of the passage is actually getting at. Um, it's, it's used so often to defend the sacredness of marriage, to defend monogamy in marriage, it's used to encourage people to get married, or to define gender roles in marriage and society, but I don't think that that's necessarily what this is talking about. The passage is widely regarded as an archetype for human relationship and a meta-narrative for God, how God designed human beings to interact across the board. It isn't so much about marriage as it is about all of us. It isn't so much about how to act in a marriage as it is about how to act, how to be, how to particularly be in relationship with and around each other. I think it's important to say um, to our church, particularly because uh, almost half of the people in our church are single, that it is okay that you're not married. Now, it, might, it may not feel like it's okay, all right? Like, I understand that there, for you, it might feel like there's anxiety around that or fear or concern. But I want you to hear from somebody with a microphone that it's okay that you're not married, right? And I want you to hear from somebody who's talking about this passage in particular that this passage does not exclude you and in fact includes you. Your singleness is not abnormal. Your newness to this church, for instance, or to your neighborhood or to your job, that isn't abnormal. It may feel uncomfortable as you're new to something, but it's not abnormal. Your distrust of other people and your, your difficulty connecting isn't necessarily abnormal, something that we all experience at different times. Your aloneness, however, that, that is not how you were designed to be. To be alone is not how God created us, okay? We were created to be in community. We were created to be in relationship. We were created to do this thing together. I believe that. We believe that. That's something that's important for us. Aloneness produces loneliness. Loneliness is an emotion that comes from being alone. It's the thing that we feel, but the, the state of being is aloneness. And loneliness is a painful way to live, isn't it? You know those times where you felt lonely. Maybe for you it's been a long time. Maybe it's been something you felt your entire life. You know that that pain point of loneliness is not the way you're supposed to be or it's supposed to be. Uh, this guy named A.J. Sherrill wrote this book called Expansive. We made it available in the front for $5 a piece. Uh, most of our uh, uh, table groups are going through this book together right now, and I highly recommend it as a companion for this particular series. Um, in this book, he, he um, says this about loneliness. He says, recent studies show that loneliness um, is regist sorry, registers in the same part of the brain as physical pain. This means that the human body takes loneliness quite seriously, and loneliness is a significant issue today from the farm to the city. Pain is one of the ways that our body tells us something isn't right, right? When you've experienced pain, you think to yourself, something about that part of my body isn't acting correctly, or it will hopefully pass at some point in time, and I don't have to continue to experience this pain. That's how our bodies say something's not quite right here. Uh, loneliness is a pain point, and it's to get our attention. Because the state of being that gives birth to the loneliness is not something that we were supposed to experience. Aloneness is not something that God designed us to experience, especially if we're a part of a Christian community. Um, Jared Mackey, the guy you 
taught last week as the executive director here, uh, my boss, handed me this book before I agreed to plant a church here. It's a book called Family on Mission. And the reason why he handed me this book is because I was having a serious problem trying to figure out how I was going to plant a church and be a husband and a dad and just generally a healthy human being. Because I, for so long, have seen people plant churches and th- that could not seem to keep a healthy lifestyle. They could not find a way to continue to be a part of their family. They could not find a way to continue to maintain a healthy individuality and a healthy differentiation um, from the work that they were doing. And he handed me this book, and the reason why this, he handed me this book is because this book provides a really, really curious and really, really important way for us to live It's a way for us to live where we don't have to choose between mission or family, mission or relationship, and we don't have to stack those two on top of each other and say, I'm going to be on mission and I'm going to have a family, or I'm going to be on mission and I'm going to be in healthy relationships, and I'm going to find a way to juggle the both, because that leaves us exhausted. And usually we suck at both of them, right? And we try to do them at the same time. But in in this book, a third way is presented. What if we were a family on mission? What if our family, the HOAG family, learned to live our lives on mission together with other people? That struck a chord. This book's also available on the bookshelf up there. And and frankly, it's, if anything, it's a cheat sheet. This is how to cheat at life, I think, if you're a follower of Christ. Like, if you're following the way of Jesus, you can cheat by doing this, by living as a family on mission, by living as an individual on mission, by living as a church on mission, by living as a person in relationship on mission. So a couple of years ago, Julie and I decided we were going to pursue this, and this has become annual reading for our family. This is something we decided we were going to begin to practice. We were going to start to do things together with other people, be a family on mission, because we knew that we weren't meant to be excluded from and and differentiated from in an unhealthy way other people. We needed to be together and have overlap in our lives in, in relationship with other people. And so we started to do this, and this is what it's looked like, okay? You ready? It means that When Julie goes to the gym, she texts a friend. It means that when she goes to the grocery store, she invites somebody to join her. It means that when we're on our way walking to the store or to a a place to eat or to the gym or to a friend's house, we stop along the way and we talk to the neighbors that we know or we introduce ourselves to the neighbors that we don't know. It's not super glamorous. It's not earth shattering. It's not the most amazing thing you've ever seen. It's not like brunch every Saturday morning with mimosas and sweatpants and it's like the greatest thing that you've ever experienced with your best friends all the time. That is not what it's looked like for us to be on mission. Uh, Julie went to a movie last night and invited a friend. I don't know if you know anything about going to the movies, but you don't talk to her in the movies. That's okay. There doesn't have to be deep huge strides in relationship every time we spend time with people. Uh, We were designed to live in community with each other. Think about Adam and Eve again. Let's go back to that story. When God said it's not good for man to be alone, he creates Eve and they're together. We get this idea that it was just like frolicking nude in this like amazing uh, (laughs) garden landscape and it was just bliss. Probably was bliss. But Eve was like, uh, Adam, grab a rake. Like, we have work to do, you know? Like, there was, there was stuff to be done. They were working with their hands. They were literally working the soil. Let me tell you how this has kind of happened in our church community here, the way I've seen this start to unfold over the past couple of years. Um, in fact, I'll use an example from literally just last night. Uh, we decided to go to the Inglewood Rec Center Halloween party, uh, which was the, the scariest thing I've ever been to. Um, <laughs> Lots of little people in masks, uh, lot, you know, sugar coursing through their veins, <laughs> lawlessness, absolute lawlessness. Tons of people packed into a small space. It was my nightmare. Um, but we went, and like 10 minutes beforehand, we texted Andy and Ariel Taylor, and we were like, hey, you should come. They're like a couple blocks away. They have kids. Why not, right? They were like, sure. They put on costumes, very elaborate costumes, super impressive. They got there before we did somehow. It was amazing. Anyway, they were there. And, and it was the easiest invite in the world. And, and I, from what I understand for them, I think it was pretty easy for them to say yes to that invite. Now, you can ask them to verify this. We did not have, like, meaningful, deep conversation because we were trying to keep our kids alive and ourselves, okay? But there was, a, there was like just this moment of overlap where our lives collided and we did something together instead of by ourselves. Here's the best part. That was the easy part. Here's the accidental part. 
before we got in the door, we ran into two other families from this church. Before we got in the door, not families we invited, families that didn't invite us, we just ran into them. Because when you start to live life in proximity, you find that you run into people more often. You find that you spend more time together with people, living your lives in relationship. It's often the mundane, regular, ordinary things that our relationships begin to flourish and thrive. Adam and Eve worked the soil together. Um, They did that in tandem. They did that together. Uh, I'll tell you another way this has happened in our church. Uh, Megan Sarian, uh, about a year ago, was like, I, I'm in. Like, I love the Sacred Grace Inglewood. I love Inglewood. I want to be a part of this thing. I'm buying a house here. So she bought real estate in the city of Inglewood. And then she has rented all the rooms out to other women in our church, okay? So this is this little house of people from our church. They, all, they live together. And, and these are funny, smart, creative, adventurous women. And they do lots of really cool stuff together, Okay. But here's another thing they do together that you may not know. They grow stuff, okay? Their house is filled with plants. Like every room, plants. Front yard, backyard, side yards, probably their cars, maybe their offices. They grow, they literally work the soil together, okay? You can ask them about this. Maybe that's like, I don't mean pejorative about growing plants, it's a very cool thing, but but it's it's kind of an ordinary thing, right? Like it's just sort of like, it's something they do together that may not be this like amazing, deep, rich thing. Maybe it is for them, I don't know. But my point is, they do something together. They do a lot of things together, in fact. Because we were actually designed to live our lives that way, believe it or not. See, aloneness produces loneliness, which produces pain because we were not intended to live that way, like ships passing in the night. We really weren't designed like that. We are designed to pursue relationships, but we tend to think that to pursue healthy relationships, we have to do all these really meaningful, amazing, Instagram-worthy things when in reality, we're to do these mundane, regular, ordinary things on a regular basis with each other, together. This is how we were designed. There's this, um, there's this quote by uh, Desmond Tutu. He's, a, he's the Archbishop, or uh, Anglican Bishop, um, that I think puts this into perfect perspective for us tonight. He says this, we depend on the other in order for us to be fully who we are. The African concept of Ubuntu says, a person is a person through other persons. When I have a small piece of bread, it is for my benefit that I share it with you because after all, none of us came into this world on our own. We needed two people to bring us into this world. We are people through other people. That is how we exist. That is how we were meant to be. We share ordinary things like bread, for instance, uh, because this is how we express our deepest human characteristic, togetherness, relationship. This happens like really briefly, and and I'm sure it's happened other times, but it was recorded really briefly in Christian history um, long after God designed human beings to interact with each other and uttered the words, it is not good for man to be alone. Um, It happens right after the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost, and and it's recorded in Acts chapter 2. It says this in verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had a need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They just decided to live their lives together. They were like, we're going to go to church together. We're going to eat together. We're going to give stuff away together. We're going to sell stuff together. We're going to buy stuff together. We're going to do things together. They set their minds on that, and God blessed that, and God multiplied them as a result of that. They did everything together. Um, on our second Sunday as a church, uh, it was Canaan's birthday. And our first Sunday was like lots of um, excitement. There was like a ton of people here and everybody was really supportive. And it was really awesome. And then the second Sunday, there were like 12 people here, which was great. And that's totally normal. Uh, I just keep telling myself that um, at least. And, and at the end of the service, I just kind of, um, kind of on a whim said, uh, we're going to go to Moe's and we're going to celebrate Canaan's birthday. And I decided to invite the whole church, uh, which was not a big deal. In fact, it, it was more like this because we literally would row out like 20 or 30 chairs right here and there was just a coffee table over there because everyone could fit in the first couple rows, even just on this side. 
And I was like, hey, it's Canaan's birthday. We're going to go over to Mosini Barbecue. You should join us. And here's what I said, and this thing is stuck, and it's something that I've said a bunch about community dinners and welcome dinners and table groups and a bunch of other things. I said, you're going to eat dinner tonight, probably. You might as well do it with me and Canaan. That's what I said. And I keep saying that every month. You're going to eat dinner at the end of the month on a Sunday. You might as well just do it here with everybody else. You're going to go about these regular, ordinary rhythms. We might as well do them together the way we were designed, the way we were created. Tonight, after the service, you're probably going to eat dinner. You might as well do it with me and Canaan over at Moe's, all right? I mean, for real, right? Why not? Like, you might as well do it with other people since you were created to do it that way. This is not to say that you are not to do things alone ever. But overall, as a state of being, aloneness is not how you were created. Togetherness is what you were created for. God modeled this for us by sending his son to us. Okay, he didn't say, come to me, get it all figured out and sorted out, and then come to me. He sends Jesus into the mess, and then Jesus just partakes in it. He just takes advantage of all of it. In a minute, we're going to take part in communion, and, and he uses ordinary elements like bread and wine. He didn't use something extraordinary and amazing and magical. He used these regular things that people experience every day. And he said, this is the thing I'm going to attach myself to for your sake going forward. Uh, we often get questions about what the name of our church means. What is the sacred grace? Um, and there are actually, believe it or not, there is more than one answer to this question. Um, but the one I become most attached to, the one that I love the most, is this. We believe that all of life is sacred and that God is grace. And next week, we're going to get into the deep and abiding, never-ending grace of God um, for you and through you. But tonight, remember that your life, even the ordinary and regular elements, are sacred. Invite someone into that. Invite someone to be a part of those ordinary, regular things, or maybe accept an invitation from someone else to go to the grocery store, or to have a meal, or to go for a walk, or to do these things that are regular and ordinary. Do these things together. That is how we were designed. I'll say it again tonight. I've said it a million times. One of the most sacred things you will do tonight is leave. We love you. We're so glad you're here. But when you leave here, your life intersects the mission of God, and you begin to take part in these regular things that happen throughout the other six days of the week, and that is where God begins to do some of his greatest work as we take part in those things together, which is how we were designed. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for the grace that you've extended to us, and thank you for the ways that that has dictated and shaped the ways um, that we live our life. Thank you, that you, God, that your grace is embedded in and integrated in to all the elements of our lives, um, and it's a matter of noticing it and seeing it. I pray that you would teach us to do these things together, to take part in the way that you've designed us and modeled for us by sending Christ. We pray these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.